event uh, when I was outside and we were getting ready to come. They said, you cannot go Usinangue Mtambo. I came here an ordinary man with my ordinary suit. I did not know that I needed to be in od extraordinary regalia. Uh, where we come from, we call this regalia. So we are now wearing the regalia of the event. So the moment you are given the regalia of the event, your sermon begins to look smaller because you did not plan a sermon that complements to the regalia. Uh, and then we stood there, and then people were asked to introduce themselves. And then people started from one side, and I was on the last end. And the first one said, I'm Professor this. Okay. Uh, maybe a mister will come. I'm Professor this. Okay. Now I'm Doctor this. Now the sermon becomes even smaller. Then they say, when you are going in there, you walk two by two, and there is a certain code of walking. But regardless, in the early 1930s, one lone solitary voice used to be heard in the British House of Commons. And this voice was heard each time saying, the, the German army is moving. Hitler is arming his people. He has set up a new air force, the Luftwaffe. It's moving on. He is setting up a new panzer division. There is a new division of armored vehicles and tankers. The war is coming and knocking on our doors. He has set up a new method of attacking. The lightning war, the blitzkrieg is coming at our door. We need to be prepared. We cannot sit on our laurels. And each time the man would speak in the House of Commons, everyone did not want to listen to him. One author called him a prophet in exile. Yet another one said of him, if there was only one horse in a race, he could still pick the wrong one. They did not like what he had to say, but he kept on speaking every day. We must be prepared and get ready for war. But no one wanted to listen to this man. And Chamberlain, the then British Prime Minister, flew to go to Munich to meet Hitler. He was reassured that we are not going to start a war. When we go back to Sudetenland, to the Saar region, we are only going to, to our backyard garden. It's still our country. We are not going for war. But in 1939, when Hitler declared war and he ended Czechoslovakia in a lightning blitzkrieg, he took over Poland. Everyone was heard when an embarrassed Chamberlain stood up in the House of Commons and he said, the war is upon us. And everyone was heard saying, Winston is back. The man they could not listen to was back. And they stood up and said, we must call this man we were calling names to come and lead this country. And when he stood on the podium on the first day of his nomination, he said, men of England, I've got no word for you, but I promise you blood, sweat, and tears. I have no word for you. The baccalaureate, the graduates of 2022, I have no word for you. We are at war. The country needs warriors. It needs men and women who will stand to the challenge of the times. I promise you nothing except blood, sweat, and tears. I've got no word for you. In case you thought I was going to give you a word. In case you thought I was going to tell you it's going to be fine. In case you thought I was going to tell you, you are going to walk in the last streets of Harare and it's going to be good. In case I promise you bread and butter, but I promise you blood, sweat, and tears. We are going to consider the God of Luke chapter 8. The message has been read already. And I'm, going, I'm not going to 
to burden you with reading the message again. Because in your hearing, it has been read. And I sit on the feet of the Gamaliels of this place, the professors of theology. I will not burden you with theology. I'll burden you with the issues of life. Because I have come to speak about life. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Jesus speaks to them a parable. And when he had finished the parable, verse 10 says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he said, Unto you it is, and he said to them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Jesus is speaking about planting, about sowing seeds, and he calls it a mystery. What's mysterious about sowing a seed? He says, unto you, I speak to others, but you are supposed to understand the mysteries of sowing, the mysteries of putting a seed in the ground. He needed to make them know that everything originates in a seed. That when God created the world, the, the world, he set it in motion by a seed so that thereafter it propagates itself without him. So that thereafter the energy that he has put in the seed produces on its own without him giving it the energy again. So whatever you are going to do in your life, the energy that has been given inside you, it's enough to produce if you know that you have been set. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Maybe let me define what a seed is. I'll start a de definition. You, 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 you are, are learned people. And learned people always started introductions either by definitions or by an implied introduction which reflected the definition. Either way, it was a definition. So let me start from botany. It's a mature fertilized plant of you consisting of an embryo and its food store surrounded by a protective coat. So a seed is a mature ovule, right? That has got its own food inside it. Huh? And then it is covered by a coat. So inside a seed, it is already an armored vehicle with a capacity to regenerate itself and with a capacity to feed itself when it wants to regenerate. So when you put a seed in the ground, it does not start by benefiting from the ground. It starts by benefiting from itself. And then it produces in the ground. Come on, church. That's a seed. And that is a noun. A seed is also a semen. Semen is a seed. You could call it a sperm. It's a seed. It gives life. That's why you are here. A fatal man, a fatal human being, if they are going to engage in an act, they will produce in every milliliter, there is about 100 million sperms in one milliliter. And they produce between two to five milliliters a fatal man. That means fatal men will have 200 to 500 million possibilities. Where you are seated, you are one out of a possible 500 million. Possibles. The act might be a mistake, but the results can never be a mistake. How can the possibility of one out of 500 million become a mistake? Even if they are born crippled, you can't make a mistake of picking one out of 200 million. For you, even you put it in terms of probability, one over 200 million, it's as if it's a zero probability that you can pick the correct one. So that's a seed. You are the product of a seed. For the sperm to fertilize, they must outswim each other. 200 million swimmers 
towards one egg, two hundreds. At one moment in your life, I don't know whether you can swim now. At one moment in your life, you were a great swimmer. You are a great swimmer. Don't look at them in their different shapes and sizes. They are masterful swimmers. That's a seed. A seed is also a source or an origin. We can say we are looking for the seed of the revolt. That, that there was a revolt. There was a rebellion. But we must look for a seed. It's still a noun. It's a seed. So what we are getting is a seed has got a tangible side of it. And there is an intangible side of it. You can actually touch a, a seed and see it. And it is still a seed. And you may also call it a seed even without touching or seeing it. So that there will be a seed without necessarily having to touch it. Are you with me? Follow me closely. A seed is also an item that you can bless in a certain place to crystallize things around itself. So you can take a plane into the air and throw and spread iodine. And then the iodine becomes the condensation nuclei. And all the water droplets start going around that specific particle until you say you have crowd seeded to produce rain. A seed can produce rain. To seed to produce, to seed to generate, to seed to have, to seed to cause to progeny. So a seed also becomes the, the descendant of, that's why you can say the seed of Abraham. So you can become a seed of, so that where I sit, I'm a seed of the moyos. Therefore, when you see, you see a moyo based on the one that has put the seed in that moyo. You are a product. I'm talking about a seed. So when Christ was speaking about a seed, he, when he said there are mysteries, he had not spoken about what I'm speaking now because he knew it. He, he limited himself to the horizons of their mental uh, capacity. I'm supposing that solution has stretched you enough to go to the next level. So a seed can also be a stimulus. Like he put in seed capital. So there was no stimulus to take it to another level. So I put in a seed capital. That's seed in the form of a noun. Let me take seed as a verb. A seed as a verb, you can then say, I seeded this field with what's. So the act of putting the seed in the ground is also seeding. It is in itself a seed. Are you following? The act of influencing thought processes is also a definition of a seed in action. So if I influence you to do things that you would not have otherwise done, in the same situation, I have planted a seed in you that diverted you from your act to act then on the basis of the seed that I've planted. So you then become a product of my seed. Are you with me, someone? Uh, let me take seed as an adjective. So an, an adjective is a word that describes a noun. So that a noun becomes qualified because of the adjective. So if I say there is a seedless lemon, I have explained the state of the lemon by saying it's seedless, but that is also a definition of a seed. So you can actually look at a young man and say this young man is, is, is handsome, but he is seedless. It's referring to his brain. 
Good young man, I might love you. Handsome is there. But in terms of seed, you are seedless. So we have a lot of seedless lemons are looking at me. After years of putting seed, we take them out and look. Lo and behold, they are seedless. How do I say that? They go in the streets of Harare complaining about the leader. The leader does not change anyone. Anything that needs to be changed is changed by you. There are men who are shouting, if Mugabe goes, I'm going to succeed. They are still in the same place. They were arguing with me. If I go to England, I'm going to succeed. A stupid in England is a stupid in Zimbabwe. A place won't change nothing. Place won't change nothing. Don't come to me and say things are hard. Where were they not hard? In 1930, there was Great Depression. Where were they not hard? During the War of Liberation, things were not well. Where were they not hard? In the 1980s, you owned nothing. You worked for the white people. Where were things not hard? They are hard any day, any time. The issue is you are seedless. They are always hard. It's not going to be easy. Because if it's easy, everyone can do it. It is the bottom that is overcrowded. The top there, there's a lot of fresh air to breathe. These are the definition. And the other definition for seed is the person themselves. So in sports, they will take a person and say, this person is a seed, a top seed. So the person herself is a seed. So this is say this one, this team is a top seeded team. So they're saying in tennis, the number one seed is Serena. They are, they are the seed. But the process of pick, making Serena the seed is called seeding. So that they go to a place based on the seed. Uh, follow, follow me closely. Follow me closely. Ma let's make haste slowly. Follow me closely. What is common in the definition of a seed that we got? What is common is that when they seed, there is always growth. You can never put seed in someone's stomach and it does not grow. The moment they seed, Someone who phone you, I missed my period. Whether, whether you are going to be happy or not depends on the circumstances. But there is going to be growth. There is going to be growth. So you, you might delay informing us, but we don't worry about being informed. We wait for growth. That, that's common. So when they see the displacement, the seed displaces, you feel the presence of, you can't not not feel the seed. It causes itself to be felt. You can't go into the world and pass by as a full stop. No, 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 no. A seed is felt. They'll feel you. That is around. You can't go in the world and pass by as a byword. That by the way, not only for jokes and jesting, no contribution. Sweet, empty, good for nothing. Allow me to be rough this morning. These podiums are rare. I might never get another chance. And when there's a seed, the principle of a seed is there is always multiplication. There is no seed that goes and is stagnant. There is always multiplication. And when there is seed, there is always movement. There is, not, there is movement. But when we speak about a seed, it's as if the parable was about a seed. Yeah. Yet the parable was never about a seed. It's 
It's as if you are saying the parable had a problem with the seed. There was no problem with the seed. It's as if Luke wanted to bring attention to the seed. No, it was never about the seed. Forget the seed. The issue was the ground. It was never about the seed. We have had trouble thinking that we have a wrong seed. Yet we have got troubled ground. All these years, we were thinking we needed better preachers to bring better seeds. All these years, we were thinking at Solus we need better lecturers from NAST. No, we didn't need lecturers. We needed the ground that is ready to receive the seeds. For where there is good seed and good ground, we are going to produce so much. Do you know that even when we have bad seed and good ground, we can produce so much that no matter what amount of seed you put on good, bad ground, you can never have a harvest. I will forgive you, lecturers. If they fail, don't blame yourself. It's never the problem of the seeds. It is in the ground. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame yourself. Don't go around saying we didn't do well. No, no, no. It was never about the teacher. It is about the ground. A sower went to sow. And when he was sowing, some fell on good ground. Some fell on the wayside. Some fell on the thorny ground. And some fell on the rocky ground. The sower did not mind where the seed fell. He continued sowing. His business was just to sow. And he was not going to retrieve any seed that has fallen on wrong ground. That was not his business. He knew, he knew. The sower's, the sower's program of yield calculation did not include the ground that was bad. He, he knew before the seed germinated that we are going to have trouble where it has fallen. Yeah, you are not listening. The sower didn't need to wait for harvest to know that the seed that is on the road is not going to germinate. He, the moment it fell there, he said, this is good seed, but we're in trouble. He knew it. So, adding the amount of seed to bed ground does not change anything. If you increase the volume of seed, what you effectively do, you increase the volume of waste on the bed ground. Good seed in the road is litter. So that we can say we made litter, but if it is put on good ground, the same seed on the road is a different thing altogether. But the sower did it so that no seeds would say we, we were never given a chance. All ground will say we had an equal chance. I, I like war because the Bible is a book of war. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about war. You, you, can't, you can't escape. The Bible is a war book. To me, when I read the Bible, I'm just from heaven to earth. It's all about Jambanja. <laughs> it's a book of serious wars. So one of the, uh, the Gestapo members who, who went on the Nuremberg War trials was asked, so you, you were working with Hitler and killing all those Jews. Why were you doing it? Then he said, 
I had an opportunity to know Hitler for who he was. I cannot plead innocent. I knew what he was doing and what he was, and I reconciled myself to the facts. Then they say to him, we are going to judge you not only by what you had an opportunity to know, but what you had an opportunity to know, but you willfully decided not to know. You would have known this, but in your brain of brains you said, I don't want to know. There are people here who did their degrees, and they were doing a degree in marketing, but they did not go beyond marketing to become practical about marketing. Good seed on bad ground. Good seed on bad ground. Now it's a disaster. If it's then bad seed on bad ground. If, if it's a thunderstorm to have good seed on bad ground, how much more roasted seed on bad ground? We are in trouble. And Christ was speaking to them and saying, I have a problem. When I have finished this message, I can't change you. The message that comes I don't know what messages are going to come to you. None of the messages will ever change a person. So it is Professor Banjura said one time, human beings do not let them think, themselves think what they do not believe they can cause to happen. If they do not believe they can cause it, they do not let it cross their minds. Okay, let me come closer to you. If, if you buy, if you, for the women, if you have a certain hairstyle, if you just go and put yourself on a certain hairstyle, you begin to see the hairstyle. So, ah. Or if you say buy a certain dress, you begin to see it around that. Ah. You don't see it before you buy it. Because there is the hypothalamus in us, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy that recognizes the things that we approve because we have started to cause ourselves to believe them. Huh? Are you there, someone? So if you cause yourself to believe that you are going to make it, you begin to see doors of making it. And if you walk around thinking that ah, I'm just a small donkey, you begin to see even your behavior, even your sounds when you speak, there is a donkiness inside it. <laughs> because human beings generally become what they gravitate towards in their mindsets. Because you can't cause yourself to think if you can't believe it. The people you say this one is crazy and wild is because the causativity or the causality element inside them makes themselves believe things that they can cause to happen. What can you cause to happen? If you don't believe it, you won't see it, you can't, you can't cause it to happen. Are you following me? If you, if you don't see it, what do you see? Do you see what others are seeing? Because if you take the racket and the tennis ball into the hand of the top seed at Wimbledon, she sees millions. The same racket. If you go to Benura, you are sitting on a stop stone, crying, he looks at the stone, he sees a sculpture, same stone. You are sitting on the stone crying. He is seeing possibilities in that stone. You cannot cause yourself to believe things that you cannot cause to happen. Start believing you can cause it. And when you start believing you can cause it, you begin to see it. You know, there are people here who have been rejected by young ladies. They never ask out. Just looking at them and they greet you. And this person is in a hurry. They say, no, no, I'm in a hurry. They say, see, she doesn't like me. When she sees me, she's already in a hurry. There are people here who just stand when people are laughing. Then they say, oh, they are laughing. They are already laughing at me. 
that, that mentality, from it grows the bigger things. But did you know that all things must then come to an end? I wonder at the seed that is grown on good ground because it produces because of the ground. Are you following? And the ground does not worry how much of the seed is consumed because it, it continues producing. It never worries about being consumed. If you worry about people eating money from you, it's because you're bad ground. Good ground can be chewed and enjoyed. It knows it will still produce. So you can take away from it, it will not worry. It will produce again. But bad ground is stingy because it knows in the first place it must destroy seed before even germinate it. Bad ground eats seed. Destroy seed. But I am happy to advise you that when I went to my rural areas where I grew up in Andina village where I used to head the cattle and I went there scouting looking for the places where we used to head our cattle. There were pathways, small pathways where we used to follow super dongeri and fresh cow. And I went there traversing. I was looking for the former pastures and I looked for the bushes where we used to have the bulky trees where we used to sleep under and the rock outcrops where we used to sit looking for them. I couldn't find them. They were gone. I was wondering what has happened to all this land. And someone reminded me, where you see all those lush green weeds where it is growing up with precision height, there used to be the path that you traversed. In the same place where you are saying that, there used to be rock outcrops. In the same place where you are looking, there used to be the big trees. Why? Because the arable good land used to be a pathway also. The arable good land used to have rocky outcrops and thorns also. But they spend time digging and uprooting everyone because the bad ground can become good ground. You work on it enough, even the bad ground can become good ground. If you are going to spend time taking the bulldozer to that place and it comes and takes off the tricks, trees, if you are going to send a drill rig and it puts all the dynamite and blasts the rock. The good ground is gone, bad ground is gonna become good ground. If you are going to take the deep uh, ripping tractor, it comes to rip the ground. The disc harrow is going to follow. If you are going to come with the leveling and the proof rolling, the bad ground can become deep well drained soils where we can produce seed in abundance. Allow yourself to be worked on. Allow yourself to become arable. God is looking for arable land. But he can even give bad land arability. He wants to make you arable. And this morning you are saying, Lord, just as I am, without one plea. I know I'm not arable. I've got boulders of arrogance along the way. I know I'm not good enough. I've got boulders of thinking myself little. I'm not good enough, God. I look at things and things I'm not going to make it. But today I want you to work on me. I can become Arabah. You also can become Arabah. God can work on you. Just as you are. It's not a secret what God can do. What he has done for others, he can do. God has no favorites. He loves you the same. God loves everyone the same. So if I come to you and say, you are a great man, I know you are a billionaire, what, what, and tell you all those things, and there are few of them, right? If I tell you that, 
and then say to you, can I have $500? I have not worshipped you. I have reduced you by what I have asked from you. So after saying all the good things, I have then summed your capacity to what I have requested. So therefore, what we request from God is the summation of how we look at his capacity. Whatever we say about him is not relevant. It is what we then tell him in terms of request that demonstrates whether we know who he is or who he is. We worship God by the enormity of our prayer request. So don't worry about telling him he's big. When you ask, he knows that you have said he's big. After asking, you say, okay, I know this one knows I'm big. So once you tell him, Bamborem Sara Sara, Makatangira Kupi, hey, Jerusalem, Maragas, Dai, Shubaya, Dazit, he knows all about those lions. So what? Who's the lion? There are many lions. But when you ask, you know that I'm the different lion. He wants to work on you. I submit to be worked on. Because if I fail in my life, it's got nothing to do with God. God is not involved. When you go into the world and it does not work, don't talk about God. He has already sowed the seed. Say, God, work on this ground until we produce. Until we produce. You are saying, God, work on me. I can't be ordinary. In my prayer last time, I was saying, God, I was created in Zimbabwe. You put me in Zimbabwe. Then someone in China comes to employ me in Zimbabwe. Ah! You put me in Zimbabwe. You are aware of in Zimbabwe. You put the resources in Zimbabwe. Someone comes from China and I start complaining, there are no jobs. For someone to come to create it from China, using things that are in Zimbabwe. So what does God do? He puts everything in the ground. The issue is the land. It's the ground. If you don't spend time analyzing the ground, you are in trouble. It's in the ground. I repeat to you, it is in the ground. I went to Jiagua the other year, and I found women who were suffering, and they had clay pots the clay pots were decorated with the glitter stones. And there were some people who were coming with sugar and saying, remove the glitter stones from your clay pots and we give you sugar. The glitter stones were diamonds. My people suffer because of lack of knowledge. The, everything is in the ground. If you suffer, it's got nothing to do with God. It's not involved. He's also wondering what is happening with these people. He's wondering. Because it's all about the ground. Take Joseph, put him in a well. He is going to excel. The issue is always the ground inside Joseph. Take Joseph, make him a slave. He will excel the ground. Take Joseph. Blame him for something that does not die. He is, he is not done as a garden boy. He will become the administrators of garden boys. The ground. So Joseph, put him in a jail. He is going to become the captain of the jail. The ground. You see him in palace. Sell him and you see him in palace. It's as if you sold him for palace work. Sold for palace work. Why? The ground. The ground. If you don't want to use your ground, we will employ you and use your ground. <laughs> we will discover what your ground is made of and we will use you thoroughly. Someone is saying, God, work on me. I, I can't be number two. No. Work on me. Work on me. Work on me, God. We've got to go to work now. You want to distamp the ground? Distamp it. 
You want to uproot the arrogance and the negativity, take it out. Be people busy trying to become political. These, these, there's no time. There's a lot of things on the ground to do. There's no time. We've got little time. You're saying God work on me. If that's your prayer, we're going to rise as we are going to pray. Just as I am without one plea. Oh, Israel, there is no God like you in heaven and earth below. You keep your covenant of love 
from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. May your name be glorified and may your name be magnified. We worship you, Lord. We magnify your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that we are the sheep of your pasture. And you are going to shepherd us because you are the true shepherd. The vibrant, honest, loving, caring shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his flock. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that one person who's revived. Who was standing at the verge of perdition. But he's saying, Lord, help me. I'm a sinner. Just as I am. I've got no plea. But I know one thing. Your love has broken every barrier down. The barriers of guilt. The barriers of sin. You have broken down. Every barrier. For the word says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Mm. But they are mighty through God. Bringing down strongholds. Casting down imaginations. And bringing down every thought to the subjection of the spirit of a living God. Thank you Jesus. Thank you my father. Now unto the people of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the blessing of the Lord follow you and overtake you. May you be blessed as you come in, blessed as you go. May you claim the promise that says, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. For he has promised to us that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will not fear no evil. His rod and his staff will comfort you. He will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He will anoint your head with oil. Your cup will run over goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. And you dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Let the saints say, Amen.